Hello, everybody, and welcome to the LFC Transfer Room live stream with myself, Maddie, Hassan, and Willem. Thank you guys so much for joining us on this Friday evening. Uh, just before we get into everything, just please make sure that you like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Have your notification bell on for all future streams and videos so that you never miss out on any uh, videos. We'll be back again tomorrow from half seven UK time. So make sure you're around for that as well for our post pre game stream, should I say, post game, getting ahead of myself. Uh, pre-game stream for our matchup against United, maybe a bit of a re revenge game there following the crashing out of the FA Cup, if you want to call it that, because I'm still fucking sick over that, but it is what it is. A couple of good topics that we have today. We, apparently, we have a, a very good news in relation to Freddy Valverde, considering, the and as well, the journalist that actually does report on this has... Um, has been known to sort of break new stories for Real Madrid. So he's he's genuinely quite reliable. So what it is is that Liverpool have offered £128 million pounds for <laughs> Federico Valverde and uh, 7 or £8 million more than uh, what we would have offered for Caicedo. Actually, I lie, 20, uh, £18 million more than we would have, would have offered for Caicedo back in the day. Um the offer is still there. Nothing's been accepted yet, but he's one player that Liverpool have admired for many years and have been following him for many years. Willem, I'll throw it over to yourself first as our resident Spaniard, so to speak, and, and knowing of all things Madrid and uh, Galacticos. Uh, what do you think of this in general? Is it, is, it, is it much ado about nothing? Or would you reckon there might be even a sliver of hope that we might get uh, Darwin Nunes as your Guayan teammate? So I, I didn't know about the journalist part. I only kind of looked at the, the newspaper as a source. And yeah. Let's just put it in this way. The newspaper doesn't really make me excited in in that sense. I don't really think he's... um he's uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really think it, it's good. From that newspaper normally isn't the most reliable with those stories coming out. It's often more of a bit of a public opinion and debate paper as well. So it's, it's, a, it, it's a bit iffy. But I, I didn't know about the journalist though. So... Uh, uh, for, uh, I don't know. What, did you say his name before as well? Because I'm I'm not too sure which one it is. Oh, I'm going to get his name here now. Thomas Gonzalez Martin. Okay, he's decent. He he has had some stories that he's broken that um that haven't been done before. But it's more. I I, I personally wouldn't look into it too much. But I not even from the fact of where the report is coming from. Just more that I I just can't see us spending 128 million on on one player under Michael Edwards. Well, Matty, I'll throw this to you. He has played central midfield. He's also played right midfield and right winger. As Willem has just mentioned about Michael Edwards, he's not keen on handing um, deals or even long-term deals to players over the age of 30, and that's where Mo Salah seems to find himself. What would you reckon are the odds of Mo Salah leaving in the summer and Freddie Valverde coming in and filling that role on the right-hand side of the midfield or the right-winger role? Uh, I don't think Salah will go this year. I think maybe next year. I think we'll do a, like a two-year extension and he might go next year. I think he's probably still got another year. There's a lot of two years he could give, really, but I think he'll, he might do another year. Um, I don't think Salah would want to be viewed as a player who the minute Klopp went, he went. As well, I do think he'll stay for that reason. Um but I do think we could get Valverde, to be fair, I do, because Madrid will need... If Madrid's selling him for that amount of money, then raises the capital for their books for Mbappe, which we know is going there. So that instantly ticks that box for them. They've got two many Camavinga and Bellingham, who they play in midfield anyway, with Modric and Cruz. Now, if Modric moves on, they've still got that, that core without any of their academy lads coming through. They've got Arda Gula as well. So mm -hmm. I do think there's... If Madrid have to sell any players, and obviously they're getting Alfonso Davies for big money, probably another one on big wages, they're going to have to balance the books somewhere, and that's someone who, who's an asset. And like, Michael Edwards has spent big money before on like Allison, Van Dijk, um, even like, like Fabinho's and stuff like that. They're, they're, they're price, prices rate rise like near 50 mil and stuff. So I know this is you're talking 100 and odd mil, but that's just football these days. I think this summer will probably be the biggest transfer window football scene because I think like Declan Rice went for 100 mil last year Declan Rice is incredible but no one's worth 100 million pound I just think that's the going right now for a world class player if you put it into context if we were to sell Alexis McAllister tomorrow he'd be over 100 million probably, the same, probably the same with Savasly probably the same with the majority of, of your A-list players 
So I do think that the market's changed, and so we will see higher play, higher prices anyway. And I do think he had come as well, um, just just for the depth that Madrid have got. It, I, don't, I just think it, it's an exciting project, and I, I know loads of people saying, "Oh, well, we don't know till till we get a manager." Um, but I, I don't know. I I think Michael Edwards has has come in with Richard Hughes and with the idea of they do the business. To be honest, that's why him and Klopp fell out. He wanted to do the business. Yeah. Klopp wanted to do the business. That's why they fell out. It's well documented. So what I, I don't wouldn't be surprised if what's Amari at, at sport and is he manager or head coach? Um I'm mean, he's been told he's been named both. I think it's manager or like I've heard people call him a manager, I've heard people call him a head coach, I've heard people call him both. So your guess would be as good as mine on I, I do think we'll probably have someone more as a head coach role um than manager. I think yeah. that might be one of the one of the fees with Edwards. I know he's more with, as an advisor for FSG, so we can advise all clubs and he'll be involved in all clubs that they do go on and purchase. But I don't know. I, I do think that Valverde is is doable um, because just, just purely for... I can see what Jen means, where the market's crazy, but I just think that's what it's going to be now. If you want to buy a player who's a proven international winner, you're going to be paying over 100 mil for, for anyone. McAllister was 35 mil for us last year. Guarantees over 100 million if we were to sell them. Oh, we robbed Brighton yeah. clean and blind, absolutely robbed them. But they got their money back on Caicedo. Just they got the fees mixed up for both players. That's the only reason behind it, realistically. Jen, just want to thank you very first of all for the four pounds 99 with your super sticker. Thank you so much for that. Uh, always going towards the channel and always helping out as always funding this summer transfer window that will go towards Freddie Valverde's fee now and his, and his wages. So, thank you so much for that. Hassan, I'm going to throw this over to you because this is a bit of a spicy one that Paul has decided to throw into the chat. With Bradley playing well, would you guys be okay with a straight swap with, for Trent for Freddie Valverde? And I can see Matty raising the eyebrow already, so I'll come back to him and Willem on this. But I'll go to yourself first, Hassan, on this. Would that be, if we were to get Freddie Valverde but Real Madrid got Trent, would you be happy with that? Yeah, uh, it's fine. He's gone. It only make. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we're back. Yeah, got you uh, we got you back. Yeah. We got you back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, th there. That was also what I was thinking. Uh, what uh, Paul said that uh, this deal will only make sense, uh, or maybe uh, will work if uh, Trent is going to the other way and he's coming. Uh, because I think uh, Valverde is being linked to uh, towards us uh, from the time Edwards was still here, and uh, Valverde I think is really liked. Uh, but uh, I have never seen him giving any sort of encouragement uh, to join us. He's always like, uh, "It's my dream to play for Real and all that." Uh, he's South American, and he's um, I think uh, he's coming from their academy as well. So. The only thing uh, uh, we won't uh, spend so much if uh, there is some truth in uh, Trent going the other way. Maybe he'll come because he's right-sided. Uh, Bradley can uh, cover. Uh, so I think that deal would only make sense if uh, they are going the other way around. Matty, you immediately started shaking your head, so I'll throw the same question to you. Trend for Valverde and keep Bradley at right back. What do you think? Not a chance. No way. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd rather Trent move into midfield and not get any other midfielder, to be honest with you. But Trent, Trent's one of the scouts in the team, him and Jones are flying the flag for, for the City, really. And I think Trent knows that. And Trent hasn't achieved all he wants to achieve at Liverpool. Yeah, it's well documented. His dream is to captain Liverpool Football Club. And he is not going to captain it until Van Dyke goes. So Trent will captain us, and then he's not going to. Once he becomes captain, he's then he's then not going to be as eyes turned by by Real Madrid. We're talking about a lad who's grew up in just like the same generation as us, idolised and Stevie G, who rejected everyone to stay at Liverpool, and he sees Stevie G as an absolute hero. He sees Carragher the same absolute hero, and I think Trent wants that. It's it's his club. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. when we talk about it ourselves and say. I'd only ever want to play for Liverpool if we was ever a footballer. Trent is also that that scout lad who, whose whole life he would have just wanted to play for Liverpool. I could see him maybe going and seeing his career off at Real Madrid because I think he's someone who 
could just sit like Gerard did in the latter stages of his career, hold deep and just ping balls. People will buy him for that array of passing. I think he could maybe go to Madrid when he's like 32 for a few years if Bellingham's still there. And again, wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't have anything against him for doing that. Like, like when Steve he left, I think everyone was just like, he, he's gone. It, it is what it is. He he's given yeah. us all cheers, and I think Trent might do that. But I don't know. He just strikes me as a lad who loves the city. He's so proud to be that be a scouser, and, and he, in every yeah. interview where he's talking about the city, he's so proud that he's playing for this club. And I don't think he'd go. I think it's just all. Don't forget, we've got a new sporting director, his contract's up for renewal, new manager. It, it probably is just his brother who's his agent putting some sort of stories all together on a bigger deal. And it is what it is, isn't it? He's not going to go. I, I cannot see him going myself. I think Bradley is very, very good. And Bradley will probably play right back. But I think that'll mean Trent goes into midfield. I think that's the best thing we, that could have happened to us anyway. Trent getting someone who was that good, it physically made the manager move him. And I think any new manager probably will move Trent anyway anyway to be fair so yeah. i don't think i don't think any of them um will, will leave like hey you just said van dyke was saying now as well i don't think any of our big players will leave i don't think any of them will want to be seen as that player we've jumped ship the minute clops went okay and especially the ones like your van dyke your salas your trends like the leaders in the side who've been there for so long we've at least got another year out of the majority but i think and even then it'd only be salary we might go based on age i think yeah. van dyke has probably got another two, three seasons in them, but Trent, Trent's probably got another six, seven. Easily. Trent, I, to be honest, I think Trent will retire a Liverpool player. I don't think he's going yeah. anywhere myself. I don't, I see if the second, as you said, the second he gets handed the captain's armband, what other club can offer him similar other than paying him out of his arse in money? And he doesn't strike me as the person that would turn his head away from a captaincy of his boyhood club for money. He'd he'd rather earn a he'd rather earn 150 grand less a week and win trophies as the captain of Liverpool yeah. than fly over to Madrid and be just another player there, if that makes sense. One of the other things that came in here is Willem, I'll throw this to you. This comes from hilariously with me being an Irish fella, a guy called Cromwell. Uh if you know, you know, but I'll get into that later if nobody knows. Um if Amarim is the future manager, then why get yet another midfielder and reference to Freddie Valverde? Realistically, Willem, if Amarim comes in, he's going to play a 3-4-3 or a hybrid of such. We'll probably need a bit more midfielders and maybe less left-backs, right-backs and whatnot. But we'll need somebody that can sort of play in the middle, play on the outside, and somebody that can fill a lot of positions. Like, like he is versatile, Freddie. I mean, I, I think it becomes more of a case with Amarim system that we're probably going to have to look at another centre-back just for the, for the rotation of the three at the back. I don't think that you're going to have any problems with Trent, with Trent playing a right wing back, for example, or Connor Bradley. Say, technically, if you look at Connor Bradley, even now, he's already almost like in a right wing back, just constantly on the right flank on the edge. And I think though that isn't truly really going to be much problem. Like, if you even count our injuries now, I think the only midfielder that's dead certain to leave is Thiago at the end of the season, and for the rest, we still have everyone. I think if we name all the midfielders we have right now, I think we have about ten or eleven midfielders coming in. And we still got, and that's including Morton coming back as well. That's including Carvalho coming back from his loan. Um, yeah. And obviously Bajatic coming back from his injury as well. So I, I'm not necessarily of the thought that just because Amarin's coming in with a system that actually we're going to need more depth in midfield. I'm actually more of the other of the other idea where I'm like, actually our fullbacks will probably be fine as wingbacks or even as, as kind of right and left yeah. midfield sometimes. But that we can actually have more of an issue with our centre-backs, especially with Kanate picking up his his occasional injuries. Um, obviously, seeing how you would play the back three out in itself, because what do you do with that left hand side? Do you leave Gomez there the entire time, or do you kind of want to adapt the system? Like, I think there's more question marks in that area necessary than that there will be for the midfield. Yeah, I mean that makes a lot of sense. Like my ideal eleven under Amarim would be Allison and goal, and then I'd love because I think Amarim and his back three would allow Van Dyke to play for another five years, never mind three years, because he could just sit in the middle and have youth either side of him in Gomez, Kwanzaa, Kanate, and just sit there and be sort of like a floor general, like a like Shaq as a centre in basketball. He didn't need to move anywhere, just stand there and direct and kind of get in the way of things. 
then I could very easily see Andy Robertson and Trent Alexander Arnold left and right right wing specifically, and Alexi McAllister sat sort of behind the front two of Darwin Nunes and Mo Salah because God above would that be absolutely fucking terrifying. Um, and then obviously I'd have like a Dominic Solan- uh, Dom- Solanke, Dominic Sabas like, and um, and uh, and like a-, a Curtis Jones in the middle then with an endo rotating in and can move to a f- move to a defensive midfielder if needs be, and McAllister can drop back, and you could have a three one four two and whatever way you want to go about it. It, it leads an awful lot to, to tactical flexibility. Um, but it's it's an interesting one to think about because there's so many possibilities that could come in, even with Amarin as manager, and even with if it was Javi Alonso coming in, how that three four three kind of leads an awful lot of of tactical flexibility. Um, but before we move on to the next topic, which is a look ahead bit to you bit a bit to the United game on Sunday, uh, just make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please make sure to also have your notifications bell on for all future streams and videos so that you never miss out on any streams. But there has been reports essentially of Wataru Endo, who's going to be basically straight back into training and basically in contention for the United game. Took a bit of a knock, was rested against Sheffield United. Personally, I think if if that was United on Thursday, he would have played, but Hassan, with Endo coming back, that seems like um, uh, yeah, Paul. I, I, we won't need a goalkeeper. It'll be fine. Um, but with Endo coming back, it seems like this is probably the fittest we're going to be, and the most of this, the strongest we're going to be without Trent, Jota, and Allison back in the squad. We'll have Andy Robertson. We'll have everybody else there. Is Endo the biggest, um, what's the word I'm looking for, X factor that will be in that game and his hold up play in midfield? Or do you believe it'll be somebody else in the game on Sunday that might take the game by its throat and control it? Yeah, Endo coming back is a really good uh, news because uh, it frees up McAllister like last game when McAllister is playing uh, as a holding. We were not creating as much chances. Uh, that's why Klopp had to uh, bring in Curtis uh, for, uh, and uh, firstly he played Gomez there, so McAllister can go uh, further ahead and create chances. So Endo is really now important for us uh, in these games, and he is uh, really does not stop running, and is full of energy. But I think the X factor will come from the front uh, because. Uh, uh, they will surely park the bus and try to get us on the counter. So for us uh, to uh, thread them and uh, get the goals uh, really quickly, because uh, you guys have noticed, uh, I don't know why we are starting really poorly uh, for 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we give the chances to the other team. So uh, we cannot manage with uh, United at their home ground uh they are now getting uh, their chances put away uh, so i think uh, we should start uh, really fast and get the goal so we can settle the nerves i think uh, 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 the front three either one of diaz nunes or uh, salah should be the best of our options and uh, they should get the goal first yeah, it's it's about being clinical early on and kind of not starting slow like we're running in, in in treacle or cement. And and if if Anderson was to go by that game against Sheffield, kind of maybe put a sting in us for lack of a better term, Willem. But looking ahead to Sunday, and and we'll get into it more in more detail tomorrow in the pregame stream. But just as sort of a brief overview, the X factor on Sunday, do you think it's going to come from somewhere in midfield? Maybe McAllister again as the tear he's been on. Is Mo Salah going to kick into form and all of a sudden bag a hat trick? I hope so. Um, for FPL purposes, is um, is Darwin Nunes going to bag two more like he done the last time against United in that seven nil win, or is it going to come from somebody out of left field like an like an Elliot or a Jones or or somebody like that that'll just bag a winner here or there? And 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 who do you think it's going to be? Um, who I think it was going to be. I mean, that there's for me. There's two obvious names that are right now put out, and that is McAllister's one of them, and 
I mean, Sal- Salah, to be fair, in the two in the last two games, he's not been in great form. But you know that the minute he does turn up, and if he does get, his, he, if he has put his shooting boots on, then yeah. it could be a long day for United as well. But I think actually, more what the biggest X factor is going to be is well, what in the United game that's been the X factor all season. What team is going to turn up for United on Sunday? On Sunday, because if you literally even look in the past couple of weeks. <clears throat> with with the FA Cup, okay, they were clinical against us. We didn't take our chances. Ended up going the wrong way. Brentford, they get dicked all game. Then somehow they got one 0 up, and then somehow concede again. And yesterday, obviously as well. The I, and then sometimes they actually put up these really solid performances against these big teams where they manage to nick a draw out of it or get a result out of it. And I think that at the end of the day, that's probably actually going to be the biggest X factor. It's not going to be from us. It's more what opposition is actually going to turn up. Yeah, it's ironic that you say that because I was looking at their win and loss totals and draws in the Premier League. They've drawn three games. They don't draw a game. They win or they lose. And as you said, it depends on what team kind of shows up. Like, uh, that that's what astonished me. I need to have a look at it here again just to be sure about that. Uh, Man United... Uh, yeah, played 30, won 15, drawn three, lost 12, and have a negative goal difference. Like, uh, Maddie, as we said, United seems to be conceding shots. I think they've conceded 200 and something shots in 2024 alone. That's not even counting half of last year. But Salah had 12 shots against Brighton. If he gets even close to that against United with their depleted back line, I reckon he could be on for a big day. Yeah, potentially. Um, obviously, they've only got one senior centre back as well, so I do feel yeah. like we'll target that. I don't know. I've just got this weird feeling that Joe Gomez scores the winner. You know, I, I just, I've just got this mad feeling. Joe you know, Wake when Vincent Company done it and took the title off us for City. Yeah, I, I think Gomez will will get a goal this year, and it'll be a big important one. So the only two big important games, like, obviously every game is important. But I mean, big games is really United and Spurs. I'd love it to be Spurs, cop end, 90th minute, it's 1-1, one, one, bang, 2-1. But I, I just feel like it'll be an un, an unlikely hero. And I wouldn't even put the FA Cup into it, really, because I think we were just that week when we played them. We were just a bad day at the office. Um, I think playing Robertson's vital because we need to stretch them. I think Gomez, even though he's been unreal at left-back, he's just a little bit too narrow for United. Yeah. I think having Robertson stretches it, we've seen that difference yesterday. Um, and even yesterday, Liverpool played worse when the opposition's lesser games like united that's where we thrive and we, we always have so i think we'll batter them to be honest and um, but i would love it i'd love it to be tight and joe gomez gonna win it just for the nostalgia we'll win them regardless but we're gonna pull like to do things the hard way and mess with us that's what oh, they yeah. do they always do it so but united are crap they're the proper really really bad um so i think we'll batter them to be fair i think the the prem's a whole different ball game to the FA Cup, yeah, and I feel like the FA Cup might be a blessing in disguise. Um, because City keeps City in, so they've got that focus as well. So, coming out and being able to focus on the Prem and getting another Prem for Klopp, I think it might be a blessing in disguise when we look back at, it at the end of the season. No, I think so as well because City basically pushed their Spurs game all the way to, and because Spurs now are doubling in game week 35 that means it has to be game week 38 or game week game week 37 or game week 38 that they're going to end up doubling again because the city game is getting postponed on the 20th because that's when they're playing chelsea in the fa cup so it's going to have to get pushed out all the way to there and then on top of that they're going to be playing real madrid twice and then either arsenal or bayern munich twice if they get through that same with arsenal are playing bayern munich twice and or real madrid or man city twice if they get through bayern munich it's the the two of them have a hilariously hard run in, and I don't think people are counting in the fixture congestion towards the end of the season. They might have easy fixtures, but when you've three when you've three games in nine days, it's not easy. And one of them is a Champions League game. It's not easy to pump that out. Like, um, but with United, it does depend on who shows up. Like, fifteen wins, twelve losses, three draws. Like. That's astonishing. It's it. They're a very hot and cold team, and a lot of those wins have been 
very, very lucky. You can see that straight away with the goal difference. How a team can be in fifth place with negative one goal difference and Newcastle that are behind them have 12, a positive 12 in goal difference, which is astonishing to me. But the other thing that I want to move on to um, is Amarim. And I see a couple of questions in the chat about him and how close he is. And, and Jamie is asking here, does he feel close? Well, he was asked the same question as Javi Alonso was, or in reference to Javi Alonso, of basically Javi Alonso has confirmed he's staying at Leverkusen for the next year. And and the question was then posed to Ruben Amorim. It was like, are you going to do the same? Can you guarantee the same? And his reply was, I can't guarantee I'll stay at Sporting. We've had David Ornstein come out and say that Liverpool are currently in talks with him. And normally when David Ornstein comes out with something, it's probably about 90% of the way there. In, in uh, So, to me, I feel Amarim is very close. They're in first in the Portuguese league at the moment, I believe. If memory serves me correct, I don't know if they've gone behind Benfica or anything like that at the moment. Um, But to me, I think it's probably as close to a done deal as it can be because there was all the talk about Alonso and then it died immediately and then it shifted straight to him. I reckon Liverpool were working on both at the same time for fear Alonso would back out and go and stay with Leverkusen. But, Willem, I'll throw it over to yourself first. Again, as our resident Spaniard and the closest one to the main story, so to speak. Um, Amarim, Amarim as a manager, you'd obviously see an awful lot more of him in the news than we would over here. How is he perceived in both the Spanish and the Portuguese news cycles? Like, is he is he seen as another Tiago Mata or is he just is he seen as anybody that could be a bigger name for a club like Liverpool or somebody like that. To be honest, mate, I think you vastly overestimate the the interest Spaniards have in football outside of Spain because honestly, <laughs> a lot of people they don't, mate, they didn't know who Jude Bellingham was last year before they signed him before Madrid signed him. Like all of my mates, all of my mates are Madrid fans. They all have no clue, and I was talking about them like, oh, mate, we're gonna we're gonna try and go for this nineteen year old kid in Borussia Dortmund, and then end up being. Madrid getting him anyway, but like as it, so, it was me talking to them about him, and they didn't have a clue who it was. As so, and that was Jude Bellingham already, and that was one of the most like famous stars around at the time. And so, Amarim, I I don't think until Sport wrote about him three days ago that Barcelona were interested. I don't think anyone even knew his name around here at least. But what I do know, a little fun fact, Stephen, I lived in Portugal about two years ago, which is around about the time where he started. And I lived in Lisbon uh, when it was Sporting. And when he came in, people were raving about him. Because Sporting had just had uh, riots on their training ground, I think, with some of the with some of the fans and some of the ex-players that were there at the time. Uh, they were not in a good spot whatsoever. And he kind of came in and obviously sort of swept them right back up. So, um, so th- from Portugal, I can tell you, I've had a lot of positive feedback. From Spain, I can tell you right now, no one even knows who he is, probably. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is it is one of those things like I, I know somewhat of what he's done and and Matty sort of he seems to have almost had a clop like and I use that word very loosely so don't nobody come at me for my neck a clop like <laughs> impact on sporting sporting were a bit of a shambles they kind of fallen out of favor they had like they'd fallen behind the likes of Benfica and Porto. They weren't winning anything. And he seems to have kind of, as Willem said, dragged them back up. And now they're won them their first title again after a God knows how long and competing with Benfica and Porto and, and getting into European competitions again, seems to be almost very similar in mirror to the first couple of years of Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool. Oh, we've lost the Sam. Were you asking me or were you asking Matty? Uh, Matty, sorry. I was asking Matty. Yeah, I mean, he does He does look like the next up-and-coming big thing, doesn't he? Like, everyone's mm-hmm. talking about him. Um, can't say I've watched much of, of Portuguese football, though. The only thing that you could really compare him to is he's a young manager who didn't really have a fantastic playing career. Who's everyone's talking about. That was similar to like Jose Mourinho when he first came in the Premier. I mean, I know he had won a Champions League, which puts him in that high esteem. Um, but he did get sporting from I believe when he just outside of like the European spaces when he took over and he's got them like he won the league last year, they're probably gonna win the league this year. So he's got them competing. 
Um, and I think the Portuguese league is a, is a decent standard. There's a lot of good teams with a lot of exciting talents. One thing that excites me with him is more he seems to trust the youth a lot as well. And that's yeah. a match that I want because Klopp's trusted our youth and it's paid off. We've got so many kids coming through. Uh, fantastic. And we've got so many more in the academy who I strongly believe will go on and play for the first team. So getting a manager in like him fits what FSG and what Michael Edwards basically created in Liverpool in terms of investing in youth, hoping yeah. that pays off, and then they come into the first team, so you're spending less, you can then sell them on for profits. And I think he's the perfect man for that. I mean, he's he's coach, he's only very coach Braga and, and Sporting. Um, but everyone in Portugal seems to be excited about him. I've seen a few people saying like they haven't been as excited about an up and coming Portuguese manager for a long time. So the only comparison, if, if he was, imagine if he was to come and he was, say, the next Portugal's next Jose Mourinho, then you sat there laughing, aren't you? Because he's he was an amazing manager, Mourinho, as, as much as many of our fans hate him. I do think he's a fantastic football manager, so he could maybe have, have that aspect. The only downside is he didn't have a brilliant playing career, so he hasn't really played with with, with the best of players. I mean, to play with Ronaldo, I suppose, at Portugal, but um, like when you look at players like Alonso, he's learnt off your. Like Raffers, Peps, uh, who else did he play under Ancelotti and stuff? And you see that and you think, oh, he's took bits from everyone. And you sit and look at Amari and think, who's he, who's he learned his trade off? Um, you've just got to trust what people are saying. And, and to be fair, last time we trusted FSG, they went and got, obviously got Klopp. I know the fans were crying out for him and it paid off. So I think we've just got to give him the chance. I think it's tough to follow the man anyway. Um, yeah. So I, I, in in ways I'm happy it's not Alonso because I wouldn't want like someone like that who you regard as an absolute club legend to come in and then shit bed. yeah and and then you you feel bad at them do you know what I mean I'd rather I'd rather that's why someone suggested the other week Steve you know that's a terrible shout but if he come in and flopped then you're not the man following the man whoever comes in after him but the disamarium if if he come in and flops then you probably would then go and get Alonso because no Gillian Blake's come out today hasn't he and said that. Alonso wants to manage us one day, he just doesn't feel he's ready yet. And I like that attitude to be fair as well. So I think a lot of managers would yeah. be scared to replace Klopp. So I think if he does come in, we've got to respect his belief in himself that he can come in and follow Jurgen Klopp. Yeah. It's, see, I'm of the mind that, and, and I agree with you to an extent of knowing your limitations and knowing I shouldn't go there yet. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, have a pair of balls, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> and and I said, and even the club came out and said it, and there was reports of Michael Edwards and 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 the recruitment team saying it's like if the if if one of their reasons for not wanting to join Liverpool or even being hesitant to join Liverpool is not wanting wanting to follow in the footsteps of Klopp, they were immediately disqualified from contention because they wanted somebody with a set of balls on that would want to come in and actually put their own stamp on it. Um, Hassan, this is a question I'll throw to yourself. It was given to me in the panel as well, but I'll throw it to yourself first. Amarim comes in. What length of a contract are you giving him? Two years? Three years? Five years? Lifetime? I think uh, it will be a shorter, uh, maybe three years uh, initially. And if he's doing really well in the second year, it can be extended to five years. Uh it will all depend because uh, there's a big hole which will be left behind. So anybody who is coming in will be judged uh, accordingly uh, how he integrates the team and the club and the culture and the city. Uh, if he is accepted, maybe, uh, and he's doing really well, uh, he will give uh, given more opportunity. As Matty said, uh, I was all in for Alonso. Uh, but uh, I really respect his decision and coming out really early because if it would have been in the summer, we will be, and he said that I am not coming or he's going to uh, Bayern, it would be, it would have been more hurtful to us. Uh, so I think uh, him giving, uh, uh, now we are not emotionally attached to anyone who's coming in uh, so we can judge him properly. Uh, and I think... Uh, he is uh, the likely uh, one who is coming to MRM uh, because his name is getting popped up and he is the most, uh, I think, suitable for uh, the club like us, who, uh, the one who I think eventually will win the uh, 
uh, with Sporting and he has transformed that team and uh, made them really better. He has already won one before. So I think he's the most suitable option for us and uh, uh, we will give him the uh, respect and the time he deserves. Yeah, it's uh, see, that's one thing that needs to be noted as well, Willem, is when a new manager comes in, Let's say we go and we win the Carabao Cup, the Premier League and the Europa League by the end of the season. That's a bit of a tough act to follow. <laughs> and I know I said I wanted somebody with a pair of balls and that would come in and put their own stamp on it. But like, realistically, from a success point of view, if you win the Premier League, the European Cup, the Europa League and the Carabao Cup, you'd essentially want to be at least competing in all of the competitions again next season, wouldn't you? I mean, of course, who wouldn't want to? But I, I think we, we also have to kind of look at, at the fact that it, it would be incredibly unfair to put that kind of pressure onto Amarim as well, of basically just expecting him immediately to take off from where Jurgen left off and and pretty much do the same. Um, I, I think, at least for me, realistically, I, I've kind of already just thought about it and said, I think realistically for next year, I'll be happy with... A, a top four finish and us and a trophy. To be honest, I think that's just where we need to start because there's very little managers who literally pick it up in their first year and immediately go on and challenge for everything and nearly and win multiple trophies. It just doesn't happen. Like I think literally the last person who did it was Pep Guardiola at Barcelona, but when he got his first year there and he basically won every trophy possible with Messi, Henry, and Etel because that team was pretty much ready already. So I I, I think as well. It just has more to do with that. I don't. I'm not even thinking about City with the whole thing with Bird because obviously with this whole luxury tax new, news coming in, uh, that rattled me even more. Uh, so I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna really like the focus on that. It's just more from the aspect of of ourselves as fans and what we kind of want from the club. I think it's more fair to just kind of as well be realistic about it. We all want to play Champions League. I mean, I think. As much as the Europa League has been enjoyable this year, I'm not going to lie. I, I was more, I was actually more dreading it at the start of the year than now in the phase that we're in with it. But I, I, I am of the point more that obviously I want to play Champions League every year. I want to be at the top, at the top fixtures of all of them, and I think all of us want that as well. I think that would just be the most, most fair point with Amarin to go to, where just I, I think expect top four and and a trophy possibly and one of the cups. And I think that would be a great start for him. And then from there on out, we can start putting higher expectations. Yeah, I, it's, 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 I, I love how we say that that's a low expectation for a Liverpool squad. But realistically, with the squad that we have, it is. Like, you'd want at least one trophy from next season and, and a top four finish. Um, something that has been mentioned here is in, like, so Sir, Sir Oswald Fortitude, great name. Um, does anyone feel that we have less injuries under Amory? I'm not sure how intense his teams are. Funny you say that, because it's also been touted in the news that one of his trainers that also used to work at Liverpool, who is apparently this medical fucking guru, is also on the cards to come with him as part of his back staff. And, and Matty, you were nodding your head there in relation to that we'll get a lot of less injuries with Amarim, purely from how he plays, his stylistic of play. And if that gentleman, I can't remember his name, you might be able to remind me of it. Uh, if he does come in and 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 we get him as well as Amarim, that that will actually do wonders for the injury department and the likes of people that would be a little bit more injury prone, like uh, Ibrahim Kanate, maybe even a Stefan Bajcelic to make sure he comes back into the squad. Uh, you're probably looking it up there now as I see you typing away. <laughs> what, what do you <laughs> do? You know the name off the top of your head, or or are you just getting it I there? Think... Now? I think it's Badeda or something like that, but I'm not too I, I'm not too sure. That's why I'm kind of I'm trying to find the t- the tweet from the Elephant Transfer Room page to yeah, kind of, that's the one I'm kind of find it back. Well. Uh, I, feel but... like, I, I can't remember his name, but I, I do feel like he's the fella who, when he left, our injuries went down the pan. I'm sure he, he didn't leave long ago. I'm just trying. To, I can't find it anywhere. And just to see when he did wear here. I mean, I mean, obviously, any manager's not going to be as intense as Klopp anyway, so that's going to help us. Yeah. In, in terms of injuries, it, it works for Klopp, um, but it works best if you've got a decent, if you're like a decent doctor. I don't even we've got a club doctor, have we since Moxon left? Um, I mean, Chris Morgan's 
because he saved his career. But I, I don't know. I just any medical staff I'm not against because we've never replaced Moxon and it's just not being very good for us. But I'm I've got the name. What's his name? Go on, Paulo Barreira. So it was Barreira, the surname. Either. Or Barrera, sorry. If, um, <laughs> make it more. For us non linguists. Yeah, How'd you spell it? B A R R E I R A. B A. It's like Paulo Barreira. Such a okay. sexy language, Spanish and Portuguese, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> If Portuguese I, is so I, funny. I, I, Portuguese sounds like Russian when you if you if you don't know what it's like. They they talk very like inwards with their mouths. So half half the time, if you don't hear it, you just think they're Russian. It's a funny thing, all right. I just see when he left us last. Just not in there. Because he left a while ago. I can't remember how long ago he left, but like it did seem like all of a sudden. Our injuries just went up the fucking bin, like. I mean, I know it hasn't helped since Moxon's left, but I'm I'm pretty sure when he left, it was that was around the time when our injuries really decreased. But right? there's not in there because he's only an injury specialist. There's no like Wikipedia page for him telling you his bloody career. So it's hard to find it when Wikipedia don't have it nowhere, is it? No, nah, maybe I'm maybe. Maybe like Transmark or something, because they normally have like a staff page as well, don't they? Oh, Is he... No, don't cancel me for this. <laughs> Is he... Is... Is it... No, nothing good ever precedes that sentence. The tweet that I seen wasn't a white fella, but the white... there's a guy that I'm looking at here that, that's as white as Christmas like, and I don't think it's him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch out right now, mate. No, okay. <laughs> no, it, it, let's just say he's not he's not Caucasian. Let, let's just leave yeah, it at he's, that. He's, he has a fair dose of melanin in him, like. Yeah. <laughs> Did he used to be at Arsenal as well? No idea. I, I know the name, but but further than that, I have no idea. To be fair. One second. Let's see here. Lisbon, Sporting Lisbon. Ah, oh, got him. I found the picture as well that was used. Hilariously, it's the same dude in the back. Okay, no, it's not. It is, yeah. Yeah, so he was at Arsenal. So he left us in 2015, 14, 15 season and went to Al Jazeera. And then he went to come to Arsenal. And then he's been. That's the there in the back. This gentleman here. That's why I was asking you, Willem. How dare you? If you click that first well, picture. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I saw that picture only vaguely from a tweet from 10 seconds. That one, uh, I don't on that it. website, it, it's got his career. Which one? The Playmaker stats? one on the player market stats. Yeah, that one. And then it's got his career. If you click that picture and then go on the website, it shows you where he's worked. Where would he have been with us? He was with, he was with us in from 2011 till 2014. So he was under Brendan Rodgers then. Yeah, I'm, I can't remember. There we go. That would have been it there. Then went over to Saudi Arabia and then back to Arsenal and then to Sporting. Well, well that would be very interesting. In Saudi Arabia up. before coming back under FSG. <laughs> <laughs> That would be very interesting if that is the case. Uh, I'm I need to, yes, yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing that now and we'll go back. Uh, so that is the gentleman who we may end up getting as well as our on the sporting side of things to help would bring. That the, yeah, would that be the year we nearly won the league under Brendan Rogers? It would have been, yeah, it would have Rogers, been. And uh, that, that year we were pretty strong the whole year. I can't remember any big injury. You think, oh, that like that's what ruined the season, sort of thing. So. You like oh, it was there expensive. nearly to the last yeah. day. Like, it's an interesting one. Hopefully, like, it, I think, I think honestly, Klopp leaving will be a blessing for the injuries purely because of the intensity of how we play. <laughs> maybe. Like, Amarim is very much more a possession based kind of a manager from what I've seen. Same as with Javi Alonso, they're very possession based to hold on to the ball. They press, but they don't like play heavy metal football where it's Darwin Nunes charging down a keeper and scoring a goal with his cock. Like it's 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 not gonna be that kind of football, unfortunately. As entertaining as that is, 
Uh, I don't think it's going to be that. But I'm going to move on to the last topic of the day, and it's a bit of a spicy one that I've come up with. Uh, just before we get into that, though, make sure to like and subscribe. Make sure you have your notification bell on for all future streams and videos so that you never miss out as well. Uh, I really do appreciate it with the channel, with everybody on the channel as well. Um, the question that I have is... Just, it came up from the LFC transfer room Twitter page that put out about how Luis Diaz has nine goals or assists in his nine goal nine goal contributions in his last thirteen games, more than he's managed to get for the entirety of last season, and he's eighteen goal contributions this season. So I done just a bit of maths, and Liverpool have scored. Liverpool have one hundred and twenty two goal contributions in all competitions so far this season, and the numbers may surprise you because some of these players have been getting slated left, right, and center. Luis Diaz has 12 goals and 6 assists. Mo Salah, ever the stalwart that he is, 22 goals and 13 assists. Cody Gakpo, somebody that's been bet about the place for his performances as well, 14 goals and 5 assists. Diogo Jada, 14 goals and 4 assists. And hilariously, Darwin Nunes is the top assister on the team with 14 assists and he has 18 goals on top of it as well. The man is on pace currently for a 40-goal contribution season and could close in on a 20-goal, 20-assist season. Not bad for a flop. But the question that I have, and I've done our main front three, 85 goal contributions between the front three of Nunez, Salah, and Diaz. And I have a feeling I might get some weird looks when I ask this question. Is this the best front three that Liverpool have had under the Klopp regime, so to speak? Is it better than when we had Firmino, Mane, and Salah? And the reason I ask that is I couldn't find another year where all three were contributing so much and we had 85 between the front three alone. That's why I asked that question. I don't I cannot find a year where Salah, Firmino, and Mane all contributed to nearly get a hundred goals in a season between the three of them. I'll throw it over to Hassan first because I see Matty's chomping at the fucking bit to get at me on this one. So I leave him to last. Hassan, Nunez, Salah, and Diaz. On paper, if you ask that question, you think you're an idiot, you're a madman. But when you look at the numbers and look at the deeper lion numbers of it, Nunez is nearly on for a 2020 season. Salah is nearly on for a 2020 season. And Diaz is on for a 20, nearly on for a 25 goal contribution season. Like, realistically, it's not out of the realm of possibility to say that this could possibly be the best, most efficient, I'll, I'll, I'll change the word, efficient front three that Liverpool have had under Jurgen Klopp. What do you think? Um, I think uh, we, uh, if we want to judge, uh, it will be uh, not only on this season, if we have to compare them, uh, it will come after uh, if they do it three four seasons uh, along the way because uh, that front three was lethal for three four seasons and uh, uh, they were so clinical uh, at that time if the ball fell to Salah and Mane it would have been the sure goal Firmino was not getting uh, that much higher numbers but he was crucial in making them play uh, both of them but uh, he would assist a lot and uh, make them a better players uh, so uh, this season they have been phenomenal i hope they continue and they do it for a couple of seasons more than surely we will say that they are better than them but not for only this season okay well i'll throw the caveat into it for a single season willem is this the best front three that Liverpool have had in a single season under Klopp? No, because the season's not over. So that that's the first one I'm going to say in there. And also, I I don't like the whole comparing thing because I if you look right now at our starting front three, which is normally Nunes and Diaz, right? if you if we're really going to compare it directly, it's just not comparable because Firmino is such a different player to what Darwin Nunes is, and even. Even though Diaz was brought in as the Mane replacement, Mane and Diaz are completely different players as well. They're just not the same. And I think also in a sense, we have a bit more depth in attack as well than we had in some of the peak years of Salah, Mane, Firmino. And I think also in that sense, that kind of also made them unreal in the fact... If you see now, now every once in a while we get it where um, 
I mean, Jota gets his injury, injuries regularly. Salah's now been getting his injuries regularly. Nunes will also get knock every once in a while where he's maybe touching goal for a game where he has to come off the bench. And that was never the case with Mane, Salah and Firmino. They were just always fit, kept on going. And just the way them three work together, like as in just synchronising-wise and, and how they play together. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I love this team right now. And honestly, I love our front, our front line and stuff and everything. But I, I can't go there yet. Of, of I, I know statistically, it's all very nice and it's all very good. But but I can't I can't compare them to the best front three we've had in our modern football era. I mean that's fair, and I understand that. And obviously, player profiles would would differ in how the play style was. And obviously, as he said, Firmino is not the player that Darwin Nunes is, and Darwin Nunes is not the player that Firmino was. Matty, you've been sitting there stroking the beard, waiting to have a go at me over this because I can guarantee I'm going to get it in the neck now. But I'll throw the same question to you. Like eighty, so the see as Willem said, the season's not done, and they have eighty five goal contributions between the three of them. On a seasonal basis, again, I haven't been able to find a season where Salah, Firmino, and Mane What's done the, the same. Season that they have? I think it's somewhere in the nineties. But the reason I say that is because like we've another month, two months of football to to play. Like Salah could easily get another ten goals. Nunes could get another ten goals. Diaz could get another five, and then all of a sudden, those three have contributed over a hundred between the three of them. So. I think I think it's I think it's like high eighties, low nineties between the three of them. That would have been like when Mane scored twenty five and Salah had nearly forty four in the season, like something mad like that. But we're not far off it as we are at the moment. So, would you even be convinced of that argument that the front three that we have at the moment is the best that we've had under Klopp? No, no, I wouldn't be convinced at all because I think when you when you look at Mane, Firmino, and and Salah, you've got to factor in that. Bobby dropped that deep sometimes for his ball retention. He ultimately played as like a 10, even though he was a nine. So we had goals coming from elsewhere as well. Mm. It wasn't, and it wasn't just, he wasn't getting as many assists because quite often Bobby was the pass before the pass. So yeah. I, th- I think that doesn't get factored in. For me, Roberto Firmino is one of the best footballers I've ever seen and I've ever had the joy of watching for such a long period of time. There's nobody in world football like Bobby Firmino. And I think for that reason alone, they'll always be the best from three under the Klopp era. And I think they were, for two, three seasons, the best from three in world football by some stretch as well. Yeah, and I just don't think statistically it, it does them any justice purely because Bobby was often, he'd get that pass before the pass. So Salah may have got the assist, but Bobby was the one who was creating that play. So that, I, th- I think the numbers are probably unfair. And I think Bobby probably should have had a lot more goals and assists for us, but he was such a selfless player. How many times has Bobby been through on goal and squared it to you? You were Naldums or your Hendersons or yeah. you know, players like that. Um, so for me, I just think that front three, it, it was unbelievable. And I would swap still to the, not based on current form, but if we were talking prime, I'd swap Nunes for Firmino in a heartbeat. I love Nunes. Even, I, even, in, I even, in, the, you, even in the style that we're playing at the moment where he's just yeah. heavy metal, like you'd still swap Firmino for him. Yeah, I think if Firmino was we are prime Firmino, I think you'd probably put Nunes on the left and you'd you drop the as I was just about to say that, yeah. Yeah, I think you'd probably do that. But for me, Bobby Firmino in his prime walks into any team in world football and he probably walks into any team in Liverpool history. I don't. Yeah, that's that's it's, that's not something I could really argue against. Like I know, I know. I Paul, I know Mane, like Mane left best left wing in LFC history. There's there's Barnes. There's that debate. But Firmino, please don't put Gakpo and Firmino in the same sentence. For but Firmino is he just he was so important. He, if you Thierry Henry said it, and it was only after that people started to appreciate Firmino. He did have a lot of haters for them first few years, and Henry said, if you want to watch the game. Watch like wait, watch if you want to watch the like the actual football. Watch Firmino. He was everywhere. Wherever the ball was, Firmino was there. He's easily Bobby Firmino is probably my second favorite player ever to play for Liverpool behind Stevie G. And I think he he's the same for many fans. Like he, he's he was mustard, and I think he gets into any Liverpool side in in history. To be honest, he was that good and so selfless. And yeah, he may not have as many goals and assists as some of the greats we've had, but. That just shows how selfless he 
was and yeah. he was everywhere. He was defending, he was attacking, he was linking up play, he was creating play, he was blocking their runners, he, he was just everywhere. And one of his legs went and he couldn't do that anymore. We 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 were that was when he was done, but he, he's unbelievable, Bobby Firmino. He's probably one of the biggest legends of this club. And I think for that reason, him in that front three makes Mane, Salah and Firmino the best one. Because Mane and Salah phew, I used to prefer Mane to Salah. Mane is one of the best players we'll ever see play for Liverpool. But for me, Neo linked all that up, and for that reason, I think I think that's probably the best front three we've we've had in modern day history. To be fair, I know there's like Suarez still in his style, and that was unreal as well. But in modern day, I think for me, Neo Mane and Salah was untouchable in world football. Yeah, it's. It's like, yeah, I'm trying to convince myself now. But no, to be perfectly honest, like I, I'm not pushed one way or the other myself. I just found it very interesting that a front three, one of which has been slated for lack of performance, nearly has 20 goal contributions in a season. And then another one that's been slated, who has not been a starter at all this season, in Cody Gakpo, has nearly 20 goals, 20 goal contributions this season. I just more so wanted to bring to light the fact that we've been on absolute fire in front of goal this whole season, and it's absolutely nuts. The fact that Darwin Nunes, one, one year removed from being a flop, an £80 million flop, is on for a 2020 season is absolutely mind-boggling. It's mad, it? it's mad that, like, the amount of people, like, most of the times we've sat, we sat on stream last year and was like, his career shows it, it takes him a year to get settled in, and everyone's like, no, he's a flop, he's a flop. Nunes is, he's going to be, he's going to be something. And he's not even hit his prime yet, which is no. the scary thing. He's like a he's fast player I've ever seen as well. He's, he's so fast. He's like ridiculously fast. He shouldn't be that fast. It's scary. He's six foot two, yeah. built like a shit brick house. And he's as fast as a player that's six inches shorter than him. Like it's it's yeah. genuinely terrifying. And I, I'd hate to be a center back because it kind of reminds me of what Larry Bird said about Michael Jordan when he was dribbling towards him. He's like, it's the most terrifying thing you can think of in your life is that watching him come towards you and he, even he hasn't a clue what he's going to do next. It's terrifying. It puts the fear of God into you. Um, but like it's the game against Sheffield kind of showed his pace that you're on about, Matty, because when Salah played through a ball, he ran, he weaved through three fucking defenders and still got the ball and nearly scored it and i'm kind of like how 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 did you do that like that should be physically impossible but that's 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 our boy that's darwin nunez um but we are going to leave it there guys we're coming up on the hour mark i want to thank everybody for joining us jen thank you so much for the four pounds 99 that will go into the freddie valverde fund for the summer transfer window and also just if you haven't done so already please do like and subscribe uh, and make sure you have your notification bell on for all future videos and streams so that you never miss out we will be back again tomorrow at 7 30 p.m uk time um and make sure you're around for that for the pre-game stream i'll be hosting that one as well and we'll get make sure that we have everybody on for that so thank you guys so much for joining us on this wonderful friday evening i hope everybody has a lovely weekend and we'd see you guys tomorrow